Hello, BookTube. We're back down here in puppy territory for another installment in our tour of the Penguin Classic basement. <laughs> the bottom shelf where my Penguin Classic mass markets have gone to die <laughs> as they wait, either for some unforeseeable instance in which I would read a mass market paperback again, or to be replaced until, until the, the wonderful day when Penguin gets around to making a new version of these things. I don't understand why it hasn't been done in a lot of cases. I, I would understand with most reprint houses, they need to look at the bottom dollar. They need to look at uh, likely profits. But Penguin publishes a lot of things that don't seem to me particularly likely to make them a profit. Uh, and in a large number of those cases, the work involved is translating the thing. And the translations for these are already done. So I... I wait patiently. <laughs> so so let's just, let's just see what we've got going here. Uh, Oh my, oh goodness. Oh, okay, so this is, uh, this is Nal Saga, one of the, one of the Icelandic sagas, and if this is here, that must mean that, uh, that the rest, yeah, okay, all right, okay. Uh, Penguin once did these. They, they were once enterprising and did, let me see, let me make a, a fan of them. They did all of, or a huge number of Icelandic sagas in their own volumes. King Harald Sagna, uh, Nal Saga, uh, Agile Saga, the Lex Style Saga. See, they did these individual volumes. And they all had uh, their Orkneyana Saga. They all had their own introductions. They all had their own uh, critical apparatus. And they were allowed to stand on their own as, as they should be. This is These are uh, one of the most magnificent literary legacies of any nation or nationality or an area of Earth. The Norse Sagas are unbelievable. <laughs> They're just unbelievable. Somewhere else in this uh, sprawling penguin collection. There is that big, fat, beautiful volume of uh, uh, Sagas of the Norseland, or what is it called? Uh, Saga of the Icelanders. Uh, that is that has a few, but I, what I really want is uh, uh, more of these. Penguin also did. Uh, a while ago, probably they're not in print anymore, about 15 or 20 years ago, they did a whole bunch of these in new editions that were lovely. Uh, they do they do periodically revisit them, but these older ones, when with each one standing on its own, each one with its own critical attention, are wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Uh, if, if you haven't ever read an Icelandic saga, I would pick one. Uh, pick a short one, see if you like. The, the, the breadth... And the insight with which they deal with the human condition, how good people can do horrible things, how horrible people can do noble things, how bravery doesn't play favorites, how violence can be capricious, all that sort of stuff is just done wonderfully. And it's also done knowingly. It's not a case of, uh, you know, some ancient epic that we pump modern meaning into. No, the writers and crafters of these songs and sagas knew perfectly well the complexities of what they were writing about. So they read... I hate to say this because it's not a justification and it's not praise, unless it is, <laughs> but they read modern. They read with a modern sensibility. Uh, wonderful to read. I, maybe maybe start, if you've never read one, maybe start with a shorter one before you work up to some of the big epic ones. Because some of the big epic ones are, uh, are amazingly complicated. They are amazingly complex works that uh that and the, the Icelandic sagas have their own way of doing things they have their own way of of being narratives so if you've never read one before you might want to read a shorter and simpler one before you work your way up but either way I don't think you'll stop at one you, it'll introduce you to a whole world uh so uh, I wonder if all of these are going to be medieval <sighs> okay <laughs> all right uh well this one is this is uh these are two. This is two in one volume. Both abridged, and both with uh, scanty, far scantier critical apparatus than they deserve. You, Penguin could easily have done both of these alone, each separately. If they can do an individual si Icelandic saga alone, they could have done these alone. But I understand. This is, a, this is about medieval France and the Crusades. One is, is uh, one of these... Uh, these are two, two, two authors of two different works. One of the works is about the Fourth Crusade, and the other is about, it's a, it's a biography of St. Louis. But uh, they, they converge on the same thing. They, they, are, uh, they have their own specific subjects, but they are also kind of panoramas of a time. Uh, and fairly good. Uh, this, is, this is 
<laughs> this is one of those cases where the English translation was just a it, it wasn't it doesn't do justice to the especially the life of St. Louis it doesn't do justice to, to the work and sometimes in, in old uh, Penguin mass markets you can feel that you can feel that the translation is a little wooden even if you don't know the original and uh, many many a time in reading them uh, reading them drove me to the original drove me to find the original and see what I was missing uh, what's oh <laughs> okay this is Ari Latham's translation of uh, the travels by Marco Polo this is not the whole book this is uh, this is edited I don't think I think uh, Penguin had a uh, yeah, this is translated by Ronald Latham, but uh, Penguin had a, a lamentable habit in some of these earlier volumes of not really trumpeting when the volume itself was edited, was abridged. Marco Polo's Travels is actually longer than this, and again, <laughs> this this translation, I mean, it was good for its day. I certainly have read this translation many times, but it doesn't do the work justice. It, it captures what Marco Polo was saying when he produced this book, but it doesn't capture how he was saying it. And that was a big deal. That was a big part of of the book's appeal. The book had an immense appeal. Of course, it's it started a whole genre of writing that was with us to this day. And there was a time when this book came out when everyone in the world was talking about it. Everyone in the, in the world. <laughs> that can't be said of many books, even in the 21st century. This book, in other words, long way of saying a short, uh, short thing that is familiar from this Penguin Basement tour, this book deserves a brand new fantastic translation. At 800 pages, with an enormous introduction, lots and lots of notes, plenty of maybe artwork, maps, pictures of the areas that are described, this, this book deserves that. And as far as I know, hasn't had it in forever. I, maybe ever? I seem to remember the last... Uh, version of this book that came out was an adapted version of this translation, even more abridged than this, oversized hardcover with lots of color photos, but why not a real version? <laughs> why not a real version of Marco Polo, for Pete's sake? <laughs> I don't get it. This is here only because I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. Can you imagine how glorious a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of Marco Polo would be? <sighs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, what's next here? Oh, Talk about old friends. <laughs> That's the problem with this this Penguin Classic basement is that these are the ones I held on to. So more often than not, we're going to encounter authors who mean everything to me. I mean, they mean everything to me. I might know other authors really, really well. For instance, the most prominent example of all, I think, would be Shakespeare. I know Shakespeare really, really well. I've read all the plays many times. I have huge chunks of plays and poems by heart. As you know, if uh, some of you have, have caught uh, allusions that I make very often in my videos, uh, Shakespeare is all through my vocabulary. And he is right to hand for quotes and allusions and whatnot. But, and and I, I esteem him more than almost any other author. I couldn't live without the collected works of Shakespeare. But, as you know... There's a difference between that kind of author and the authors that you love, that you love personally as friends. Uh, and Shakespeare is the most prominent example of an author that, that I, I, I esteem and I value more than anything. I couldn't live without his works, but I don't love him in the way that I love the authors that I love. Uh, same thing with Dickens. I, I, I know Dickens, I esteem him, but I don't love him. I've just never been able, it's never worked with me. It works with other people, but it's never happened with me. And uh, this particular author, <laughs> it's pure love. I really like, for instance, Boccaccio, but I love this. <laughs> I love, I love Chaucer. I absolutely do. And this is often called, this is his Trojan epic. He, he like I, <laughs> uh, could not resist in his writing life, eventually, finally doing a Homer, a Homer pastiche. <laughs> uh, and, and many people have said that this is his masterpiece. Many critics whose, val whose opinions I value have said that this is his masterpiece because it is finished, polished, it knows, the end knows the beginning, so to speak, as opposed to the obvious candidate, the Canterbury Tales, which was supposed to be infinitely bigger than it is now, in which we have large chunks of it in fragment only. We wonder what the Canterbury Tales as a complete work would be like, whereas we don't have to wonder that with this book. We we have the complete work, and I, it's had many lovely editions. I don't know if it's in print right now. 
I don't know if it's in print right now. I have to hope that Penguin and maybe Oxford World Classics both have a version in print. Uh, but <sighs> I can't praise it high enough. This is this is uh, the Neville Coghill translation, which uh, okay, the, the purist in me wants to say that it isn't really necessary to have a translator of Chaucer. All, all it's necessary is for you to spend a couple of un uncomfortable days figuring out his English. A couple of uncomfortable days, a couple of uncomfortable weeks, a, a couple of uncomfortable reading sessions where you know that something really important has just been said, but you're not really sure what it was. You do that for a little while and you'll have Chaucer. And it makes a difference. Because Chaucer has, was incredibly keen to the rhythm and the bounce and the rhyme of his own language. And if you take his English out you, you take him out of his English and put him in modern English, you have to sacrifice some of that. And you, with, un, with Chaucer, unlike with, for instance, uh, two completely different languages, you can easily see it. You can easily see that something is being sacrificed. And then you just have to wonder how important it is. And the more you read Chaucer in the original, the more important you see how everything is. So I, I, I mean, Neville Coghill, uh, he did a translation of the Canterbury Tales. It's one of the best-selling things that Penguin Classic ever did. It's been reprinted. Uh, more than I think probably any translation other than the King James Bible. It's Neville Coghill's Chaucer Canterbury Tales is everywhere. And Coghill had a method that I can't really that I can't really object that much to. If it weren't like for instance, if it weren't for him, if it weren't for a Neville Coghill Englishing Chaucer into into, you know, mid twentieth century English I have no idea how many fewer Chaucer fans there would be out there, and I want as many Chaucer fans as possible. So, but he had a method of of rounding off, of uh, bottlerizing just a bit. <laughs> Chaucer needed bottlerizing in 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 his view, because Chaucer was writing for a court uh, with a capital C full of adults, very much real world hardened adults who knew brutalities on the like of which you nowadays in the 21st century have to go to Game of Thrones to see when the, so they were the epitome of the, the court where he where he wrote where he wrote these works and where he often performed them uh, was the epitome of the that odious 20th century phrase work hard play hard so when their poet got up at the podium and was going to recite for them the evening's entertainment the evening's TV uh, they were perfectly happy if some of the elbows were sharp, if some of the, the language was was spicy. Uh, and later translators into modern English weren't always happy with that. They, it seemed to them somehow uh, improper for Granddad Chaucer to be talking that way. And you get a little of that in Neville Coghill, even in this book, which has, which has quite a bit of raciness in it in its original. Uh, but still, Coghill has an ear. He very much has an ear. This is very much... Chaucer was the, the heart and soul, no matter how Frenchified he was. He was the heart and soul of England. And so was Coghill. And you, you can feel the the correspondence there. So I, I guess the, my, this is my way of saying, if, you see, if you've if you never read this book and you see this in a used bookstore and you see that it's translated and you think, well, okay, is it a good translation? Is it a bad translation? It's a good translation, yes. It's a good translation in the, in the way that a translation can be. Uh, so... Uh, what, what do we got here? Oh, okay. All right. This is the the Song of Roland. Uh, uh, again, one of the most popular books in the world in its day. This is uh, translated by Dorothy Sayers, the mystery author, uh, who had a very good ear and was a scholar in her own right. I, I can't stand the uh, the professional snobbery that has er that has erupted in mainly in the twentieth century, but it's it. I, it doesn't continue. I was going to say it continues in the 21st century, but of course it doesn't. In the 21st century, in the 20th century, there was an eruption of professional snobbery as the acad as academia became more and more institutionalized. It became, if your book is translated by someone who is not a professor of that language at an established university, then that translator must be a bumbling amateur. And isn't that cute? And, you know, pat them on the head and send them away. But what we want a real translation, we'll go to an academic. That attitude took hold in the 20th century and is poisonous 
Dorothy Sayers knows her way around these texts and especially how to render them into pleasing English better than any academic. Same thing is true with her Dante. Uh, and I, I can't say that, that it got even worse in the 21st century because the 21st century has managed to make a fad even worse than that, which is to disdain all expertise of any kind. <laughs> so so now it wouldn't just be that people would say, well, if it, Chanson de Roland, if, it, if the Song of Roland is, is being translated by someone who's not a credited academic, then I'm going to look down on it. Now it would be, well, if the translator admits on social media, on Instagram, in between cat pictures, that they've spent any time at all, that they've worked on it at all, well, work is disreputable. Expertise is for dead white men. Expertise is a tool of the patriarchy. So so I, as much as I thought in the 20th century that it couldn't get worse, it did get worse, thanks to George W. Bush, who demonized expertise. And we've just taken it from there. It's now at the absolute extreme. <laughs> but one way or another... If you, for again, I, I, uh, if you see this and you say, oh, it's translated by Dorothy Sayers, who's the author of the Lord Peter Whimsey Mysteries, how good can it be? It can be very good. It's very, very good. Same thing with her Dante. It's very, it's very, very good. Uh, it's just not, 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 as good as her translation is, nothing in this volume would give you the slightest hint of why this thing was so incredibly popular for so long. It wouldn't give you the slightest hint. In order to give you that hint, you need a, not only a better introduction and better notes than this volume has, but you need a better translation. I hate to say it, of Dorothy Sayers, I'm here, I'm a huge fan, but you, you need a better translation than this. You need a translation that is willing to work harder to cast the book's spell. And this, this translation doesn't really. And of course, the most, the most popular book of this era, by far, like, this was enormously popular, Marco Polo, enormously popular, and then you have a book that was ten times more popular than all of them put together, and it's a book that most people haven't even heard of, and that Penguin has never translated, no one has ever translated. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's The Romance of the Rose. I think I've seen two popular editions in the last 150 years. Everybody knew that book backwards and forwards, and it cast a spell, and people haven't radically changed. It could be made to cast a spell today, same as this thing. But uh, instead, we have these slightly creaky old translations. Uh, if uh, uh, Let's see what's next here. Oh, okay. All right, this is George Bull's translation of uh, Vasari's Lives of the Artist. But again, you look at this and you think, you look at that, Lives of the Artist, you think, wow, okay. So this is all, you, you, you wonder what it is. You've never heard of Vasari. So you look at it, you look at it and you say, the Lives of the Artist, you've got Chimabue, you've got Giotto, you've got uh, Bruno Lesci the creator of Bruno Lesci's Dome. You've got Donatello. You've got uh, Botticelli. Uh, you've got Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, Titian. You think, oh, okay. So this is just a Renaissance collection of small of short biographies of great artists. Fantastic. Oh, great. But Vasari is five times this long. It, he didn't write about lives of the art uh, of, the, of the great artists. He wrote about lives of the artists and his some of his minor works, some of his lives of ours who are now minor, Totally unknown. Only an expert could pick them out without an identifying plaque at a museum. Some of those minor lives are better than his major ones. The same thing with Plutarch's lives. The, the same thing is done. Excuse me. The same thing is done with Vasari. He is usually chopped to bits for the marquee names that have survived the time. But that's not the point. That wasn't the point of his book. If I remember correctly, George Bull does a very good job. But I, for Vasari, I would pick. Uh, there was an every. I think it was Every Man's Library did a two volume unabridged in a box set that was just beautiful. I would recommend that. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Look at book. We're down on the floor. Yes, we are. We're down on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would recommend an unabridged for sorry, but actually, now that I say that, probably not. The, the, these, these older books not only are my, my oldest friends, but they also bring out the teacher in me. And I guess, no, I guess I wouldn't recommend that because it would look intimidating. And I don't want any of these things to drive off potential readers. A one volume of Vasari that has all the famous people, translated by a guy who gets the job done. He doesn't capture Vasari's chattiness, but uh, you probably look down on that. But one way or another, this volume probably would work for, uh, yeah, I think, I think Everyman Library also does a one volume with all the big names. So maybe if you, if you never read Vasari and you're curious, uh, maybe that's the way to start, absolutely, and then move on to the big box set if Asari casts a spell on you. 
I don't know that he will. I don't think George Bull's translation casts a spell on anybody, but maybe. You never know. Some people are, sensi are sensitive to what they're missing in a translation. Uh, well, let's see here. What's Oh, okay. All right. This is R.A. Suter's translation of uh, the Alexiad of Anna Kamenya. This is her, uh, her biography of her father, who was Emperor of Constantinople. Uh, and who had to deal with a crusade, not the fourth crusade, but the first crusade, and he, uh, what are you doing? Oh, baby, what are you doing? Hmm? She's a little bit restive. <laughs> so, uh, she's a fantastic writer. This doesn't look it, not, and this is, this is, uh, just a, a battered old fresco. <sighs> It looks, these old penguins look unappetizing, and they also, I had to reinforce this one, but the, some of them can't be read. You, 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 you'd tear this apart to read it in this mass market, unfortunately. Uh, but boy, talk about a great work that comes out of a period that nobody knows about. <laughs> so that's something. Uh, what have we got? Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right, this is Benedict Ward's translation of the Prayers and Meditations of St. Anselm. This is mostly his prayers, just to various saints on various occasions for various themes. Hard to imagine this having an audience today. Uh, uh, I think I got it mainly because I mentioned that uh, I mentioned that Cambridge, Massachusetts used to have a Penguin Classics bookstore, nothing but Penguin Classics. And uh, I worked there and when it when they closed it down, uh, they had a going out of business sale and I worked that sale. I think I just grabbed this then. And have just held on to it ever since. I don't know that I would ever read Saint Anselm in English, uh, but uh, let's see. Let's see what we have next here. Oh, okay. All right. This is Chaucer. This is uh, this is a Penguin uh, omnibus of his shorter poems. The, what they say, what's called here the love poems. We have uh, the House of Fame, the Parliament of Birds, the Legend of Good Women, and his great great book, the Book of the Duchess. Uh, just just fantastic. Chaucer at his at his most conversational at his least epic, at his most intimate and enjoyable. I don't know that anybody knows this. I really don't. I have, I have taught the Canterbury Tales many times, and I can't count the number of times that I've had really smart undergraduates express surprise that, to learn that Chaucer ever wrote anything else, much less that he wrote lots of other things. And and when they read things like this, I, they they were just stunned. <laughs> it didn't read like... It, it, this read like, uh, like Chaucer, almost in conversation. Uh, boy, oh boy, though. I know that Penguin doesn't make this anymore. I don't think pro Penguin probably doesn't make a Chaucer right now, except the Canterbury Tales. And the Canterbury Tales they make is probably still Neville Coghill. I mean, yes, he made them a wheelbarrow full of money, but <sighs> anyway, uh, let's. Oh no, no, that's not true. That's not true. They, I don't know what they still make, but once upon a time they made a Canterbury Tales that was not translated. God bless them. It had plenty of interlinear notes, so you could, you know, on the right-hand margin, you could see what this particular word means, but it was not translated. I know they did that at one point. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. Uh, okay, this is uh, Bishop Eusebius. This is his history of the church. Again, it, you look at it and you think, oh my God, an early history of the Christian church. This is going to be really boring. But again, uh, Eusebius, like, like other uh, church writers that we've seen, Eusebius really had an eye for drama and for dialogue and for skillfully crafting a scene. In fact, there are many scenes in this book uh, where you read the scene and you see the skill and then you have the presence of mind to stop and think, wait a minute. Okay, but what about, but what about, what, what about for five or six active elements in the scene that he has left out in order to craft his story? It's, it sets up a wonderful dialogue between the reader and Eusebius himself. It's amazingly good. This translation is by G.A. Williamson, uh, and I don't think I've ever read it. <laughs> I hate to say. I know I usually make fun of booktubers who have books on their shelves I've never read. But I, I've read the introduction, and I've read the notes in this volume, but I don't think I've ever read Eusebius in English. Uh, I don't know that I would like doing that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but let, let's move on here. Oh, okay. All right. This is uh, C.F. Colbert's translation of a one tiny fraction of uh, the Emperor Justinian's Digest of Roman Law. Uh, Justinian is remembered mainly for the military campaigns that he authorized but did not pay for, for his generals to try and reclaim as much of the Western Roman Empire as they could, and they had miraculous success, because two of them, Narses and Belisarius, were tactical and strategic geniuses who could uh, perform miracles with, a polyglot, with polyglot armies that were underfed, underpaid, and couldn't speak with each other. <laughs> but, but, uh, but Justinian himself had a real 
achievement. That was an achievement that he authorized but did not pay for and did not adequately reward. Uh, uh, but the him crafting the law, an actual detailed digest of Roman law, this volume covers theft, rape, damage, and insult. There were plenty of other segments. And he crafted them all. He hardly ever slept. <laughs> uh, and he was he was very worried. He had a nervous stomach, had an ulcer, he had an overbearing wife. Uh, he felt an extreme paranoia. He was extremely paranoid. He was a wreck, <laughs> but he was an incredible workaholic. And he drafted, wrote, conceived of a lot of this stuff himself. And the the digest of Justinian was the absolute backbone of almost every Western legal system ever since. <laughs> so, so much of the DNA of what we consider to be the rule of law derives from this book. Uh, and I, I, and Penguin just made a classic of it. God bless them. They still do sometimes today. They and, and in the late twentieth century and now, the, back then, they they still sometimes come out with Penguin classics that you look at it and think they cannot possibly expect to sell that, except maybe in schools. Uh, and I love that. <laughs> I love that about them. This whole this whole Penguin classic basement tour is basically a bunch of suggestions to fill that uh, that quixotic mind frame. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on here. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, my. All right, this translation is by Alexis Brown. This is Alexander X. Coleman. This is his... It's just a pirate book. This is a, a translation of his stories of pirates in the 17th century from all nations on the open seas when piracy was rife and was often government-backed. Uh, this is a Penguin classic you won't see very often, and uh, and I doubt that they make it anymore. This is uh, this was a perfect example of the adventurous the adventurousness of Betty Raddus, the editor, the Penguin editor Betty Raddus, who perfectly wanted yes to have all the Greek tragedians, all the Roman historians, you know, all that sort of normal stuff in the Penguin classic line. But she also wanted to find classics. She was a pioneer in that spirit. Penguin classic has that spirit like crazy in the 21st century, and I love it. I love it that that you can't. I love that you can't tell from month to month, with with anything like certainty, what the next month's Penguin Classics will be. I like that feeling. Uh, even though you can sometimes, you know, cast your lot with a book that ends up not being a classic, or that isn't worthy of the title, like this thing, this is not a classic in any way, and I have railed against that, but I still like the adventurousness, very much so. Uh, so what's next? Oh, God, well, all right, well, we've mentioned it over and over again. This is the Neville Coghill Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. This is, uh, I've had 80 million copies of this thing. I'm sure you've seen it. If you've seen Chaucer in English, it's probably been Neville Coghill. And it has, it has a, a kind of, of charm to it. Here, let's, let's do the, uh, let's do the very beginning of the prologue. When April in sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all, the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. And you can see that's kind of a, a harumphing schoolmaster type thing. Even that little bit of Chaucer in the original is bouncy and happy and gay, whereas in this version, no. <laughs> no. But nevertheless, it's direct, it, it's immediate, you get it, uh, and Coghill just goes on that way for hundreds of pages, and it, it, it gives us a kind of Chaucer. <laughs> and I would rather have this... Uh, than no Chaucer at all. I would rather have that inviting people to say, hey, you can read this because it's really good, than to have Chaucer turning people away. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, let's... Uh, oh, okay. Balazar Castiglione, The Book of the Courtier. This is a translation, again, by George Bull. Uh, again, he he doesn't capture the, the spirit of the life of the thing at all, but this, is, this was Castiglione's handbook for how to be a courtier, how to be... Uh, Sincerely fake. <laughs> this is what he's going at here. How to be sincerely fake. How to polish yourself for public life, for being in public, for behaving in public, speaking, joking, disagreeing in public, mainly around your social superiors on whom you are dependent for money and food and protection. Uh, it was an invaluable book in its day because there, there was a, th a thriving industry for courtiers and a lot of people who were in a position to be a courtier at some court with a capital C, didn't know what to do because they were the sons of gentry from the country. Maybe their father does the king a favor, kills someone the king wants killed, all of a sudden the family is ennobled and brought to the capital city, mainly London, Rome, and Paris, and suddenly the older boy, who's going to inherit his father anyway, is suddenly his father is a courtier and the boy is expected to behave, and this is... 
the boy and the father maybe didn't know. So this is this is a way to polish how you behave in public. Uh, uh, Castiglione has a, a bad rap as someone who was institutionalizing insincerity. I don't know, though. That removes the part, yes, insincere, but also... Uh, uh, sincerely insincere. He wanted you. He wants his courtiers to care about what they're doing, but it has to be perfectly done. There's a performance element to it. Uh, if I remember correctly, this this translation really doesn't capture a lot of that. Uh, but but the introduction's great. The notes are great, and the translation will work. It will do the job to give you an acquaintance with Castiglione. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, <laughs> oh goodness gracious! All right, it's a. Uh, this is Penguin doing Ancient Ireland. Early Irish myths and sagas, a Celtic miscellany. Uh, this, this is basically the stories of Cucullin and a bunch of other bits from uh, the Red Branch and from the various myth cycles of Ancient Ireland. Uh, good stuff, but uh, badly in need of work. <laughs> so we've got a little vein of slightly galumphing translations here. That's not good. Uh, Okay. Uh, well, this is not a galumphing translation. This is Betty Radis herself translating The Praise of Folly by Erasmus. I have no idea how many copies of this we've seen so far, <laughs> but but this is yet another copy of the mass market Praise of Folly. She does a wonderful job uh, translating Erasmus, so I, I can't really complain that much. I just, there's a lot that's not there. And she knew that. She, she knew that perfectly well. Uh, and then let's let's stop with this one for now, because this video is getting long. And this... Uh, Okay, this is the Penguin Classic uh, Jungle Books by Rudyard Kipling. So once again, we have all these older people, and then you get a modern one that I can't live without either. Uh, and I, I absolutely love the Jungle Books. I think they're fantastic. I think they're so much better than how they're usually dismissed as colorful kids' books. Uh, but anyway, that's that's plenty long enough. <laughs> that's uh, that's it. So we're I think we have one more video to go for the Penguin Basement. So we'll we'll, we'll get to that in due time. And in the meantime, I'll wrap up for now, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.